Good evening. God bless you. This is Calvary Grace Church. I'm Pastor Philip. This is our evening service. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, again, as we turn to your word, lift it off the page. Let it impact the lives of those that are listening. Give them ears to hear and eyes to see. In Jesus' name, amen. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, we read this. May I never boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And then if you go over and you just hold that thought for a moment and you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, we read this. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom, as I proclaim to you the testimony about God, for I was resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is the central fulcrum or balancing point of the Bible. The Old Testament points forward to the cross. The New Testament points back to the cross. The cross is that medium balancing point on which all the scriptures stand. Paul repeatedly makes statements about the importance of the cross. May I never boast in anything except the cross. Well, we, we understand that the cross is where Jesus purchased our salvation. but I may be able to show you where there might be even more to it than that. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. Again, it's a direct reference to the cross. The cross puts teeth in our faith. The cross is that power point, or that point of power, rather, that stands out in the whole Bible. And as again, I said, it balances everything. The Old Testament, it looks forward to it with all the various sacrifices and ways that they conducted themselves in the Old Testament temple. It points to what is going to happen on that cross. The story of Abraham and his son points to what's gonna happen on the cross. And by the way, that plays out in the very location of the cross. Story after story after story in the Old Testament points its finger forward to the day Jesus dies and rose again, incidentally. And in the New Testament, the New Testament believers are clearly praising God, walking around delighted that Christ went to that cross and purchased them and Paul would tell us that it's not a salvation by works any longer. The Old Testament was by works. The New Testament is by faith. And out of that faith comes your works. Paul would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, For since the wisdom of God, or since in the wisdom of God, the world for his wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. The Jews demand miraculous signs and the Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. You know, um, television has done untold damage to the gospel. 
even more than radio. Because secular people have made shows that are meant to go out and appease everybody, make everybody happy, and let everybody think that those that die without Christ are just fine, they're going to rest in peace. No, they're not. And worse than that, make everybody think that by doing good things, you're going to somehow attain to eternal life. You can do all the good things in the world and go to hell. It's not based on your ability to do good things. Heaven and hell does not swing on what you do. It swings on what he did. When he said, Telestai, it is finished. Your salvation was finished there and then. And your works cannot add to that. The Jews demand miraculous signs. Pull a rabbit out of a hat. Do something miraculous for us. And the Greeks look for wisdom. Tell us something very smart that we haven't thought of. And he says, but we preach Christ crucified. He brings it right back to the cross. The very center of the gospel. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews. Again, because they're looking for magic. And foolishness to the Gentiles because they're looking for great wisdom. But to those whom God has called, that's you, if you're a believer, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Everything hinges on the cross, the place where Christ shed his blood. And I hope to show you just another level of how significant the cross is. Before I go there, I want to walk you back to the beginning of the Bible. To the day Adam and Eve did what they did when they fell. And the moment that God came in and interviewed them. And specifically when he turned around and interviewed the devil himself. Take your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 3, verse 13. Genesis 3.13. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you've done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you've done this, cursed to you above the livestock and all the wild animals. You'll crawl on your belly, and you'll eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Now, medically speaking, if you're going to get bitten by a snake, the place to get bitten is in the heel. It's the thickest skin on your body. But if you're going to have your head crushed, you are not going to survive. He will crush your head. He's talking to the serpent. This is the promise of a coming Messiah that would crush the head of the serpent. And you're going to bruise his heel. You'll strike his heel. In other words, the blow on him will not be fatal. But the blow on you it will be absolutely fatal. It will spell your end. It'll be a completely fatal blow. And so with that in mind, we begin to look into what the 
the Word of God says concerning Satan. In Psalm chapter 68, verse 2, we read this. Our God is a God that, who saves. From the sovereign Lord comes escape from death. Surely God will crush the heads of his enemies. That's kind of a strange threat. Unless it has some real meaning to it. Is he actually going to crush the head of somebody or something? Is there perhaps real meaning to this? Or is it just hyperbole? Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And while you're turning there, remember everything hinges on the cross. Take the cross out of the Bible. And I can't even say you've got a good book. It absolutely is necessary and integral to the story and for the salvation of mankind. There was a version of the Bible that came out some years ago. I think, I could be wrong, but I believe it was the Reader's Digest or some group like that that came along and decided to remove the miracles out of the Bible because they just weren't believable. And just keep the cute and good stories that is no longer a Bible. The Bible depends upon the cross. You're in 1 Samuel 17. And it says, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war and assembled at Succoth in Judah. Now, before we go any further, the Philistines were a seafaring group who landed in Israel on the coasts, specifically Gaza, and the cities along the coast. And they were the sworn enemies of Israel. You'll see why in a few minutes. Their hatred for Israel was unmatched. When the Romans came in in 70 AD and they threw the Jews out of Israel during a thing called the Diaspora, the Romans changed the name of the country from Israel to Philistine land, or as you know it, Palestine. That's where the name Palestine comes from. It was a way of humiliating and rubbing in the defeat of the Jews to the Hebrew nation by naming their land after their worst enemy. It's very significant that there is a group today that call themselves Palestinian who are at the moment calling gas the Jews and murderingly with wholesale terror Jewish people. They are the modern day Philistines in many ways. They pitch camp at Ephesdemum between Succoth and Azak. Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the Valley of Elah and drew up the battle lines to meet the Philistines. And the Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with a valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. I believe that's something like three meters. By the way, you might wonder why I hate the metric system. It's not because of my age. I hate it and will never tolerate it and never like it because it was one of the very first moves toward globalism. 
bring everybody into one measuring system. It was the forerunner for a global government that will eventually come. And so, yes, I despise it. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out from the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his leg, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung around his back. His spear shaft was like the weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him. This guy is nine feet tall. He is built like a Sherman tank. He is covered from head to toe in armor. And more than that, he's actually got somebody just to carry his shield. There's two of them out there. And Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? Are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he's able to fight and kill me, we'll become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you'll become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. I defy the ranks of Israel. That's exactly what is going on today as I preach this sermon. The Philistines are still defying the ranks of Israel. On hearing the Philistines' word, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. That's the very essence of terror. To cause your enemy to be terrified. Jump to verse 22. David left his things with the keeper of the supplies and ran to the battle lines and greeted his brothers. As he was talking to them, Goliath, the Philistine, champion from Gath, came out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. And when the Israelites saw the man, they ran from him in great fear. It appears that some of the Israelites had begun to come down the hill towards the Philistines, hoping just to engage the Philistines. But out came Goliath again, shouting his usual insults, and all the Israeli army packed up and ran back. Incidentally, they're not running anymore. Verse 31. What David said, David, by the way, had heard these insults, and he had been talking to people around him and saying, well, you know, uh, I wouldn't let that happen. I, I go out there and whoop them. I kill them. I'll take them apart. And that message got passed on to Saul. So verse 31, what David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him, not knowing, of course, that he's tiny. He's the smallest of his family. And David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go out and fight him. You know, there's something wonderful about cocky teenagers. And that's exactly what you're dealing with here. You're dealing with a teenager with more testosterone than brains. And he is just not afraid. He's looking at this man mountain, and he's just seeing a target that he can't miss. He's some, seeing something that absolutely is, is going to, God is going to give him the victory. He knows it. He knows it in his bones. He's ready to go down and take him out. And Saul looks at him. Now remember, Saul is taller than all of the rest of the Israelites. Saul is the obvious one to go out. The Bible says that when he was chosen and anointed, he was a head and shoulders taller than everybody else. So if you're going to put anyone up against Goliath, who's nine feet tall, you would want to put the tallest man in Israel up against him, but Saul's a chicken. Israel was terrified. And this man keeps coming out day after day after day, shouting insults. And Saul replied, you're not able to go out against the Philistine. 
and fight him. You're only a boy and he's been fighting, been a fighting man from his youth. You're a kid. You can't go out there. We would be staking our entire future on you winning. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it and struck, struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by the hair and struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. Now, by the way, these were not grizzly bears, but they were bears. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. He said, he's a fighting man from his youth, so what? I have gone out. I have defended my father's flock. I have fought off two of the greatest foes known to the shepherds of that time. And I win. And I'm ready to go down and take him on. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. You know the story. He tries to dress David in his outfit. I think what he wants here is I think he wants the Philistines to think this is Saul coming out. He's wearing Saul's armor. And Saul would have had insignia all over his armor. And so he's hoping that the enemy will look and say, well, that's Saul coming down to fight. But David puts that armor on. He can't move around in that. He absolutely can't do it. He can't fight in that. And he takes it off. In verse 40, then he took his staff in his hand. He chose five smooth stones from the stream and he put them in the pouch of a shepherd's bag and he slung uh, and his sling in his hand and approached the Philistine. He goes down to the riverbed and he finds five smooth stones. When I was very new in the ministry and um, suffering at the hands of some nasty people in the congregation, it just seemed like they knew I was young, knew I was new, and the devil really wanted to stop me from continuing in the ministry. And um, I, I was getting pretty down. They were quite ruthless. At one time, we had a very snarling bunch of people. We no longer have them, by the way. If you're a snarling Christian, you won't last in this church. You'll find it very uncomfortable. You'll leave. God will take you out. Somebody came and handed me, actually a couple of our family members handed me five smooth stones they had bought in a rock shop, knowing that I like rocks. They had no idea of what that was biblically. They were children, little children. They had thought to buy me a gift and they bought me five smooth stones. They sit at the head of my bed, even today. He chooses five smooth stones. And some people say, well, look, if he had such great faith, why didn't he just go out there with one stone? Because that was all it was going to take. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Samuel, chapter 21, verse 15. And here we're going to learn something very significant. 2 Samuel, chapter 21, verse 15. Once again, there was a battle between the Philistines and Israel. And David went with his men to fight against the Philistines, and he became exhausted. And Ishbi Benothbi, one of the descendants of the Rapha, that's the Raphaim, that's the Nephilim, that is those satanic beings from before the flood that came back after the flood, whose bronze spearhead weighed 300 shekels, that's seven and a half pounds, or for you people, it would be 3.5 kilos. And who was armed with a new sword, 
said he would kill David. But Abishai, son of Zurah, came to David's rescue. He struck the Philistine down and killed him. In other words, David was ready to go up against him, but he was exhausted. And this guy took on David, uh, took on, yes, took on David, and David was losing. And so one of his men came in and helped him. He struck the Philistine down and killed him. And then David's men swore, saying, Never again will you go out with us to battle, so that the lamp of Israel will not be extinguished. In other words, David, you're too valuable to go out and fight. You stay back. You're a general. We'll go do the fighting for you. But notice, he's a descendant of the Rapha. We know them as the Raphaim. In the course of time, there was another battle where the Philistines at Gob, at that time, uh, Sebekai, the Hushite, killed Saf, one of the descendants of the Rapha. Again, another giant called Rapha. Another battle with the Philistines at Gob, Elihan, the son of Jera Oregim, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath the Gittite. Now, by the way, uh, the NIV has left out the words, the brother of Goliath, Lemmy, Lemhi, who had a spear uh, with the shaft like a, uh, like a weaver's rod. So he did not kill Goliath. He killed Goliath's brother. Goliath had a brother. But notice, we're seeing here that there are others of these giants in and amongst the Philistines. Still another battle, which took place at Gath. That's the place where Goliath is from. There was a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes uh, on each foot, 24 in all. He was a descendant of the Rapha. Again, these are giants. When you go back to Genesis, you see there are giants in the land. These are giants. When he taunted Jonathan, son of Shimei, David's brother, killed him. These four were descendants of Rapha in Gath, and they fell at the hands of David and his men. So David will take out Goliath, but there are four other giants, and no, they're not necessarily his brothers. One of them is Goliath's brother. The other three are not. But David is prepared. He's picking five smooth stones because he's going to go down there. He's going to take out Goliath, and he's going to be ready for the other four. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 41. Meanwhile, the Philistine and his shield bearer in front of him kept coming closer to David. Boy, I can hear the drums. I can hear a march as they're coming in. And I can, I can, I can hear the marching uh, music as they're coming together and a battle is about to happen. And he looked at David uh, and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. And he said to David, am I a dog that you come out against me with sticks? The NIV softens this, and it's a shame because what he's saying is, that, am, I, uh, am I effeminate that you would come out against me with, with, with this, this runt? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. Oh, and by the way, he also had his shield bearer. But I come against you in the name of Jehovah. Almighty God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied, this day the Lord will hand you over to me and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. You should know that is going to happen again now you are going to see that there is a god still in israel and that god fights for israel and that he will defend israel and david is once again going up against the philistine it's playing out right in front of you on your news the horrific things that the palestinians have done are so horrific that I wouldn't even quote them to the service this morning and I'm not going to quote them now. But I can tell you this, it is worse or at least as bad as Nazi Germany. It is utterly vile. 
the way that they have murdered children. I will tell you this much. They have beheaded 40 babies. 40 babies beheaded in their cribs. That's just one issue. So much more has been done. It is utterly beyond your comprehension how terrible they have been and what this attack has been like. You are going to see David and Goliath once again and understand David is going to win because God is with him. All those gathered there will know that it's not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves for the battle is the Lord's and he will give it unto our hands. As the Philistines or the Philistine moved closer to, to him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and he struck the Philistine in the forehead. And a stone sunk into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. Now we know this guy is covered up. He's got armor, chainmail type armor on. And a stone should have bounced off, but it appears that his forehead was not covered. I remember in Sunday school, they told us that there was just a tiny hole in the front here in his armor and his helmet. Well, I don't know that that's accurate at all. His helmet obviously didn't cover his forehead and the stones struck him in the forehead and down he went unconscious. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead and the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So the David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand. He struck down the Philistine and killed him. What an ignoble death for that Philistine. A fighting man, a fighting machine, a war in himself. And he's taken out by a shepherd boy with a sling. And David ran over to him and he took a hold of the Philistine's sword and he drew it from his scabbard. And after he killed him, he cut off his head with a sword. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Remember, the contract was, if you win, we'll be your servants. Instead, they turned and ran when they realized they no longer had the upper hand. I find it strange that he cut off his head. I mean, he's dead. If I was going to try and kill Goliath, I think I would have taken the sword and put it through his heart and left it there, sword standing up in the dirt. But instead, he hacks off this giant's head. How very interesting. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath, that's the Philistine city, and the gates of Ekron. These cities, by the way, are in the press these days. Their dead were strewn along the Shimon road to Gath and Ekron. And when the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered the camp, the Philistine camp. And David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put the Philistine's weapons in his own tent. Now the story gets curiouser and curiouser. We've all heard the story of David and Goliath. I've heard it so many times, I could pretty much do it off by heart. But nobody paid a lot of attention to the last few lines. He cuts off the giant's head and he takes it to Jerusalem. Take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 27, verse 32. Matthew 27, 32. As they were going out, they met Simon of Cyrene, or a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. And their place, uh, to the, uh, they came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. 
and they offered Jesus wine to drink and mixed with gall. But after he tasted, he refused to drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Think of the name of the place. It's the place of the skull. Now, when you go to Israel today, they will show you two different places where Jesus was apparently crucified and two different places where he was buried, one Catholic, one Protestant. I've been to both. Neither one of them looks like a skull. At Gordon's tomb, if you look across to the bus station, down in the valley, on the hill beside it, there is some rough rocks. And if you squint your eyes sideways and turn your head and pull a face, you might be able to say it looks a little bit like a skull. But frankly, I've seen stores downtown that look more like a skull. There's next to nothing in that mountain that looks actually like a skull. So why would it be called the place of the skull? And specifically, in Greek, it was called Golgotha. Well, it turns out there was a champion for the devil in the Old Testament whose name was Golath, Goliath. His head was cut off and David bought it to Jerusalem. Could it be that it was buried at the very place where the cross was placed? Is it possible that in fact, what we have here is David once again coming against Goliath, this time Golgotha. By the way, its other name, one you might be more familiar with, and certainly one we're familiar with, is Calvary. It means the place of the skull. The only skull that we're aware of that could be buried there was Goliath. Now remember what he said. He said back in Genesis, he said this, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. Could it be that in fact what happened here is that the skull was buried on a mountain right beside Jerusalem. And that's the place where Christ was crucified. And it signified the promise fulfilled from Genesis chapter three. He will crush your head and you will just bruise his heel. I believe that's exactly what happened. Underneath that cross and deep down in the ground was the head of an army led by a satanic Raphaim, a champion for the devil, a giant. And the giants incidentally had intermarried into the Philistines and there were more of them we know of Og, of Sion, and so on. There are, there are many of them. Some we know by name. Some we know are 13 feet tall. We even have descriptions of their bed, how big their bed had to be. These massive creatures. But one was taken out by David. And now, a thousand to 1500 years later, the son of David would bring the ultimate destruction of the devil. And there would be a spiritual crushing of his head and a literal crushing of his head. It's a remarkable story. No wonder 
the New Testament believers all said, may we not boast on anything except the cross of Christ to whom which we are crucified. May I never boast in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ through whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. When I came to you, brothers, I didn't come with elegance and superior wisdom, but I proclaim to you the testimony of God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone that believes, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. All of this was powerful because Christ died on that cross and purchased for us our salvation. Wouldn't it just be like God to have fulfilled the promise in the Old Testament literally? It would be a remarkable, remarkable thing. I hope one day they'll excavate and find the skull on which the cross sat. May the Lord bless you, keep you, cause his face to shine upon you. Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for the peace of Israel. Father God, defend the Israeli forces against that enemy that has done so wicked. Father, they're not just wicked in my sight, but in your sight. What they have done is an evil beyond even that which was from the Holocaust. Deal with them accordingly, Father. If there are some of the Palestinians that are innocent, save their lives and save them from Islam. Bring them into the truth of the gospel. Yes, Lord. Deliver them from this wickedness in Jesus' name. Protect the Israeli Defense Force. And I thank you, Lord, that Jesus Christ has died and purchased for us our salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.